Good evening and welcome to the Centre for Independent Studies. My name is Tom Switzer. I'm the Executive Director here at CIS. As anyone who follows the serious US media will attest, uh, Kevin Rudd has emerged as one of the world's leading sinologists. As president of the Asia Society in New York, he's written the lead articles in the current issue of Foreign Affairs magazine. Uh, every two to three months, he appears as the lead article on China-related matters in the most prominent Wall Street Journal editorial page. And he appears regularly on the leading US political news most notably Fareed Zakaria's CNN GPS program. Kevin Rudd, of course, is Australia's uh, former Prime Minister from late 2007 to mid-2010 and then again in 2013. In fact, this evening marks the 15th anniversary of Kevin Rudd's victory over John Howard's government, 15 years to this day. Kevin Rudd, yeah. Kevin Rudd is also uh, a former foreign minister, and these days he's president and CEO of the Asia Society in New York. A little known fact too is that Kevin Rudd has been doing a PhD uh, at Oxford University under the tutelage of the distinguished professor of Chinese nationalism, Rana Mitter. And just this year, Kevin has published a well-acclaimed book called The Avoidable War, the dangers of catastrophic conflict between the US and Xi Jinping's China. So we've invited Kevin to visit CIS again. He was a regular speaker 15, 20 years ago. Uh, he's back at CIS to address this intensifying economic and security competition between China and uh, the United States, and of course, where we in Australia fit in. And with that, please welcome back to CIS, Kevin Rudd. Thank you very much for the um, warm invitation uh, to be here and for the warm welcome this evening, uh, Tom. It's good to be back at CIS. I've been here a number of times over the years. Um, I agree with some of the things you do here and disagree with some of the other things you do here. Um, but that's the good thing about this uh, robust democracy of ours, that you can have an intelligent discourse both on underpinning concepts of philosophy um, and I know full well where the CIS comes from in terms of its defense of classical liberalism, uh, but also in questions of policy that works or doesn't work based on empirical measures. And that's where I think CIS has always been a good contributor to the debate. Uh, and one of the things you just mentioned, Tom, which is uh, something I always have uh, resonated with is the soft bigotry of poor outcomes for indigenous Australians. Um, I'm the author of the apology. And the apology was one step in the direction of ensuring that we close the gap with Indigenous Australians, which means providing an opportunity for Indigenous Australians to realise their full human potential. And so I'm proud to have backed a number of programs, including that by the Australian Indigenous Education Foundation run by Andrew Penfold out of this town which is a combined government private sector initiative which is now run to some hundreds of millions of dollars uh, to place uh, Indigenous kids from right across this country, often from the most remote areas, into the nation's uh, leading uh, private schools. We've now graduated a thousand of these kids over the last decade since I launched this program uh, and they are now in the professions rising uh, through the ranks and providing the next generation of Indigenous leadership in Australia. I knew I was on the right track when the federal bureaucracy said it wouldn't work. <laughs> and that's the truth. That's exactly what happened. So um, I'm all for effective private-public partnerships so long as they work and we can empirically measure that they deliver the results. Just a few words from me because uh, Comrade Switzer is about to provide, uh, uh, provide a cross-examination uh, of uh, my crimes against humanity uh, uh, and my views on uh, China gen generally and US-China relations in particular. But for the, I'm only back here from the States for a week or so and I don't expect people to have followed what I've been up to since I left political office. But the Asia Society, where I'm now president and CEO, is an American institution that's been around since 1956. Um, it's a Rockefeller institution. Um, was set up way back then in the early phases of the Cold War in order to build relations between the United States and the emerging countries and economies of Asia. 
And I think back on Rockefeller doing that three years after the end of the Korean War, halfway between the two major Taiwan Straits crises of the 1950s, and six or seven years before uh, the Vietnam War got going in earnest. This was quite a visionary uh, effort on his part. Since then, we uh, uh, have uh, grown to have 250 staff in 15 centres around the world, five in the United States, 10 in the rest of the world, primarily in Asia, but now moving into Europe as well, in Zurich and most recently Paris. But our mission statement is navigating shared futures and uh, our policy institute, of which I was the founding CEO about six or seven years ago, the Asia Society Policy Institute, we've now grown into one of the larger dedicated think tanks in the United States purely on contemporary Asia. And within that, the Center for China Analysis is one of the larger think tanks now exclusively focused on China. So that's my day job. <clears throat> um, in terms of the other stuff that I've been doing, uh, the reason for writing this book um, is it comes out of a project uh, which I began working on in Harvard quite a while ago in the late Obama period um, before Trump. Um, and I know Han uh, was, uh, has also spent time in Harvard in that period. As I began to explore what was a new strategic framework within which these two giant gorillas in the front living room of global geopolitics could possibly work within short of war. And so uh, I left it to one side and uh, pursued the work I was doing at the Asia Society, but came back to it to write this book because things started to fall through the floor big time in the last year or two, to the point where I began for the first time to become concerned about the real world prospect of armed conflict. Now, this is not a peacenik book. I'm not like that. Tom knows me quite well. Uh, I have a very realist view of international relations. Um, <clears throat> and this is a framework which seeks to accept the reality of the strategic competition between the two sides and to construct an architecture of what I call managed strategic competition between them. Um, as I said, and as has been written in articles, as has been headlined in articles I've written for foreign affairs within the framework of short of war. And the last piece of research I've been working on is, uh, is uh, as you said, foolishly, I decided to enroll in a DPhil at Oxford. This is a crazy idea for someone who was in their late 50s at the time. <laughs> this is really dumb. Um, but I did it. Um, it disciplined me to do one thing, uh, and that is... Uh, uh, to force me to read the party's ideological literature under Xi Jinping in order to understand his frame of Marxism-Leninism. Because with Xi Jinping, we see the return of ideological man. Uh, and the basis and the conclusion uh, of that, if you like, the executive summary of that thesis is the article just referred to in Foreign Affairs on the cover this month, which is called The World According to Xi Jinping. Um, and that's where I summarise his worldview in three points. Xi Jinping has taken Chinese politics to the Leninist left. He's taken chi the Chinese centre of gravity on economics, pol economics policy to the, uh, to the Marxist left. And he's pushed the dial on Chinese nationalism to the right in support of a much more assertive foreign security policy. <laughs> So for folks either in this country or around the world who think this is the China that we grew up with in the last several decades, uh, going back to the beginning of Deng Xiaoping's reform program in the late 70s and early 80s, as someone who's been an analyst of this from the get-go, either in government or in, in uh, the bureaucracy or in the Australian Foreign Service, which is where I began my work, this is a radically different beast. Um, and the sooner we wrap our head around the dimensions of the change, the better, because a common understanding analytically of how China has changed provides a better basis for us to frame both American strategic policy and response and where we fit as an ally of the United States within that. I just wanted to start off with the question of wolf warrior diplomacy. You deal quite a bit of your book on this subject of wolf warrior diplomacy, which is basically an attempt by the Chinese Communist Party to use its growing economic power to coerce or harm those states that pursue policies not to Beijing's liking. And of course, we in Australia felt the full face of this wolf warrior diplomacy during the pandemic, particularly after Canberra's call to, uh, for an international inquiry into Wuhan. 
Why do you think the Chinese government has backed off on its wolf warrior diplomacy? Because it didn't work. And, uh, and there has been <clears throat> a dialing down which has occurred, if you observe it closely, over the last year around the world. And in this one, we're not Robinson Crusoe. If you speak to colleagues in Japan, in Korea, uh, or in uh, Sweden, or in Norway, or in other parts of Europe, as well as uh, among developing countries. Uh, the wolf warrior diplomacy experiment was actually propagated globally, not just with us. <clears throat> yes, we did receive the particularly uh, rough end of the pineapple. It's a Queensland expression. <laughs> uh, the, um, and, uh, but uh, we were not uh, alone. And so I think the deep calculus uh, which began in Beijing over the course of the last year uh, was to conclude that this was being counterproductive. Um, Deng Xiaoping's strategy for uh, global diplomacy was quite clear. Uh, keep a low profile and uh, hide your strength, bide your time, never take the lead. This was uh, encapsulated in what was called Deng's diplomatic guidance notes. Mm. Uh, and every party congress used to recite this as the axiom of the age. In other words, focus on the economy, gradually expand our foreign policy footprint, but don't aggravate anybody. That was kind of the, 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 the dogma. And then Xi Jinping explicitly changed it at the party's foreign affairs work conference at the end of 2014. Uh, it disappeared as an axiom, and its replacement was a Chinese four-character expression called fen fai you wei, which is uh, striving for achievement. And that was a conference uh, which authorized the entire Chinese international policy establishment to go out in the world and change the status quo in a direction more compatible with Chinese interests and values. So China in passive foreign policy mode from late 14 moved into active foreign policy mode. But what they've discovered is that by frankly uh, going too far, it was producing uh, the reverse effect. So the last 12 months I've seen recalibration of this as I've said recently, speaking to events like this in Europe, in Berlin and Paris and uh, in Brussels and London, mind you, it was hard to find a government in London when I was there. <laughs> the, um, the, um, the, uh, all of us should get ready for a global charm offensive because the Chinese now know right. that this was overreach. Not for the long term but at least for the period. Okay, so you say that uh, the, the wolf warrior diplomacy has not worked and that we should expect a charm offensive from the Chinese government, but isn't this also a victory for Australian statecraft? This is Peter Harcher in the Sydney Morning Herald, past guest at CIS, quote, after all the rants and insults, the political freeze and the trade bans, the president of China brought his intimidation campaign against Australia to a politely meek end. We can now expect the trade boycotts to drop away in the months ahead. This is a victory for both sides of politics staring down the great power. That's Peter Harcher in the Sydney Morning Herald. Kevin. Yeah, well, I, I think where the Chinese in particular, the Chinese Communist Party miscalculated, <laughs> is that if you say to Australians, change your course or we will punish you, uh, there is no way anyone in the Australian body politic from the centre left or the centre right was saying, OK, that's fine, off we go, we're going to uh, bow the knee. It just doesn't work that mm -hmm. way in this country. Uh, so I think it was a radical miscalculation of the Australian psychology in particular. It may have worked in other political cultures, um, even within the Western world, but certainly not with this one. And so whereas we on the Labor side, for example, looked at what uh, Morrison did in his call for a, um, a international independent inquiry into mm. the origins of COVID. And we critiqued it, I did, because he didn't take the time to bring an international coalition with him. Would have taken another week, get the Europeans on board, get the other Asian allies on board, come out with a joint position, um, uh, because we think that would have been more effective. And it's much harder for China to punish individual states if there's a group of you rather than just one. I call it the Australian doctrine of hunting in packs. It's far better to have a group with you rather than to be out there as an independent agent. But it having happened, mm. 
um, then, as you know, the Labor Party um, uh, provided uh, bipartisan support for the Australian position and against the unilateral punitive measures which were then taken. Okay, so notwithstanding this charm offensive that we should expect, you've also argued that China seeks still to dominate the region and, quote, redesign the world order in a manner according to the interests, values and power of China. Tell us more. When we look at China's rise, you, you need to look at it in a couple of different, um, as it were, trajectories. The one nearest to China's shores, which is, of course, the Taiwan contingencies, which most of us are familiar with or are beginning to become familiar with because they're frightening. Um, and then those around it, South China Sea, East China Sea, China's influence on the Korean Peninsula, what China's doing in cyber and space. This is about China's immediate strategic environment. Let's call it a, around Taiwan, the oceans to the south and the north of it. Let's call it China's East Asia strategy. But the classical debate, which, as you know, Tom, has been had for some time, does China aspire just to be uh, a regional superpower or a global superpower? Uh, it is very much the latter. Mm. Um, and therefore, China's timetable for that is quite gradual. It's mid-century. Um, but when you look at, when you deconstruct the text of the internal narrative within China about the future of the international system, it is quite plain that what China seeks to do under the Communist Party of Xi Jinping is to change it. Um, in that conference I mentioned back in 2014, when the instruction went out to move onto the active front, not just the passive front, getting rid of Deng's diplomatic guidance of hide your strength, bide your time, never take the lead, and go out there and strive for achievement. It was the same conference at the end of 2014 where Xi Jinping used this phrase, we are now engaged in what is called a guoji zhi du zhizheng, which is a struggle for the future of the international system. I remember being in Beijing at the time, you know, eating your, eating your cornflakes in the hotel of the morning, pick up your people's daily, uh, have a bit of a skim through, see what's happening uh, in, uh, on the sports page, not much. And, um, and, then, and as I was trained to do in the embassy years ago, you, you look for the new emerging key lines and themes. And I just saw this thing, struggle for the future of the international system. This was new. And this is how we monitor change in the Chinese system, why I place a lot of emphasis on ideological change, because it becomes the headwaters for other changes mm. in the real world of public policy. So that has been a project in being since then. How has it been manifest? Starting with um, China in the existing institutions of international governments trying to change the norms. For example, in a whole bunch of UN resolutions, including the governing uh, documents of the Human Rights Commission in Geneva, China, supported by its friends and partners around the world, have sought to begin to strip out the language around universal human rights, resolution by resolution. And this is fought in pitched battles in every UN-related committee these days. Uh, and in UN Security Council resolutions, which are about using peacekeepers to go in and fix disputes, for example, our standard provision over the last 20 years has been to ensure that peacekeeping operations are also mindful of ensuring that the human rights of those uh, within those countries are properly respected and adhered to. Uh, and China has sought to rip those out as well, supported by the Russians and the Security Council. So if you want a practical case study of where a new, as it were, form of international governance is emerging, uh, it's at uh, levels like that. You've called yourself a hopeful realist. And you said earlier this week that unless, unless growing strategic tensions are managed, we could be at war with China by the end of the decade. Now, just a few years ago... I say we, I said um, the Americans, United States. The Americans, right. Just a few years ago, you slammed others for saying the same thing. Let me put you on the spot here. In August of 2019, you attacked the federal Liberal MP, Andrew Hastie, and by implication, Senator James Patterson, who had been warning about the strategic risks posed by a rising China in our region. You said they were being irresponsible yet neither Hastie nor Patterson talked about a deadline within the next decade. 
Now, does this mean that the Liberal hawks were right about China all along? Not at all. What it meant was... Uh, <laughs> Because, because uh, I know they would have provided you with the text to that question. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, you I think might, I'm like that? Um, I might be We're from, independent at CIS. Uh, I might be from Queensland, but I'm not dumb. <laughs> but I'm not dumb okay? <laughs> Xi Jinping's unfolding uh, strategy for the region and the world has opened like this over the course of the last decade. The first instalment was the one I referred to in 2014, uh, on which I wrote at the time. This represented a departure from the past. Even before Xi Jinping, as we discussed in your office before, uh, we had noted early changes in Chinese strategic posture and policy in the South China Sea and in the region, which we reflected in the 2009 Defence White Paper under my government as Prime Minister, uh, which China objected to volubly at the time. Then, what you saw in the period 1415, I think in a Chinese response to perceived strategic weakness from the Obama administration over Syrian red lines. You remember Obama in late 13 uh, promised to um, uh, attack a line in the sand uh, to take action against the Syrian regime if they use weapons of mass Mm -hmm. destruction. They did. I remember this acutely. I was in an office and we were working closely with the Americans at the time Mm. on that. 2013. Uh, And he balked. Mm. The Chinese reclamation campaign of islands in the South Pacific began in 2014 and 15. Mm. So when you perceive weakness Mm -hmm, as a mm -hmm. Leninist, so what I'm saying is this is an unfolding spectrum. Um, What I objected to with about various uh, statements by representatives of the government at the time uh, is along these lines. If you're representing the government, you actually have to manage the bilateral relationship with China simultaneously. Well, they were backbenchers, to be fair. Sure, but you were working within the government's political ecosystem, and I was more concerned about the sort of statements emerging uh, from Peter Dutton at the time as well. Because here is my overall point. If you're in government, either the centre-right or the centre-left, using the megaphone to describe what China is doing does not equal a strategy. It equals uh, an articulation public politics of what you think is going on with China, but it does not materially either prepare the Australian Defence Force, uh, nor does it materially contribute to an integrated uh, national China strategy. So my critique of that whole period, including the gentleman you've spoken about, is that they were mouthing off a lot without me seeing the evidence of the emergence of a substantive Australian national China strategy at the same time across all the instruments of national power. Let's bring this to academic critics like uh, Harvard University's Steve Walt, uh, the prominent author Gordon Chang and uh, Professor John Mearsheimer from the University of Chicago. Now, they would argue that the policy of engagement in the 90s and the 2000s, well before the period you're talking about in 2012, 2013, and even 2009, they would argue that engagement was an unmitigated disaster. This is what John Mearsheimer uh, told me on my ABC radio national program about a year ago. What engagement says is that if we can integrate China into the international economy that the United States helped create during the Cold War, we can integrate it into that economy, integrate it into institutions like the World Trade Organization, it will become a very powerful country, but it will become a peaceful country and a so-called responsible stakeholder in the international system. Now, for a realist like me, this was a crazy policy. This was remarkably foolish because what you were going to do in my story was you were going to create a very powerful China that was then going to try to dominate Asia, push the United States out of Asia, and develop power projection capability that can be used outside of Asia to change America's dominant position in the world. Engagement was a major mistake. Okay, that's Professor John Mearsheimer, past guest at CIS. Kevin Rudd, have we just been feeding the beast? 
Well, I, I love being ambushed by Mearsheimer on this stage. And uh, <laughs> I have debated Mearsheimer on a public stage like this in New York. Uh, and, and on Radio National. And on Radio National on a program which shall remain unnamed. <laughs> uh, and at least in terms of audience response in liberal New York, uh, I won the debate against <laughs> Mearsheimer. But what would you expect in New York? Um, here's the bottom line. He just uh, paraphrased, for example, the idea of China as a responsible um, global stakeholder within an overall strategic framework of engagement. Uh, that was Bob Zellick's um, strategy, as you know, as articulated by Bob. That's a Republican Deputy Separ Secretary of Strait State in the uh, first uh, Bush administration. Responsible stakeholder. Yeah, yeah. Um, which is engagement. Uh, China becomes richer, works still within the international rules-based system. As it becomes more powerful, it supports the system because it's been fully integrated into the global market economy mm -hmm. and market discipline. But this is the school that. of thought that Misham is attacking. No, no, I'm describing yeah, it, yeah. but also lest it be thought in this room that this was an evil plot of the left. Uh, this actually oh, no. came out of the Bush administration. It's bipartisan. Uh, uh, and secondly, bipartisan both in the United States uh, and in this country and in the rest of the world. But... What Mearsheimer conveniently ignores is this, that in all the articulations of the engagement strategy, it was engagement plus hedge. In every articulation, if you go back through the record, in the United States and here, uh, under both, uh, frankly, the Howard government and under ours, it was about engagement plus hedge. What's hedge? That if China changes strategic course, that you are still sustaining your defence capabilities, your military capabilities and your alliance structure to be operationalised against a change in China's course. So engagement plus hedge has actually been the strategic orthodoxy during that period. When we reached 2017, and to give credit to H.R. McMaster, the National Security Advisor under Trump, uh, one of the few rays of uh, rationality in the midst of chaos, H.R. Um, uh, McMaster uh, drafted a national security strategy, which I'm absolutely confident Trump never read mm -hmm. because he never read anything. Mm, that's what uh, John Bolton said too. Yeah. Is that right? Well, yeah. John Bolton was our keynote lecturer a few months ago. Okay, yeah. Yeah. But H.R. McMaster said, we've looked at this, uh, for a long time, China's posture has changed and it is time, therefore, we changed our strategic response. And to give H.R. McMaster great credit, he framed the concept of uh, strategic competition. To give the Democrats great credit, they could have said, oh, dear, this is a critique on us. No, the Democrats actually formed a bipartisan consensus around the concept. So that if you look at what the um, Biden administration has done under Jake Sullivan, under Secretary of State Blinken, under um, the rest of the, um, the uh, foreign and security policy team, it occurs within that framework laid down by the Republicans in 2017. But my argument is, contrary to Mearsheimer's critique just now, that was always consistent with the frame of engagement plus hedge. Of course, the last thing to say about it, were you going to automatically assume as an offensive realist that China was always going to be hostile? Well, Mishama's argument is that, like all great powers, rising great powers, they, they start to seek a sphere of influence in areas on which their future security and uh, prosperity depend. And so they'll go to great lengths to create a sphere of influence, just like the Americans did in the 19th century. So what China's doing is not all that different. The problem for China, though, is that the reigning hegemon is the United States and the US will go to great lengths to hedge against China. So the response of the the existing hegemon, um, or what Allison would call in th his book on Thucydides' trap, Graham Allison from Harvard uh, University, the um, the um, the existing power as opposed to the rising power, is that the existing power can either confront in the tradition of Thucydides' trap and either win or lose, or uh, the existing power can seek to balance uh, and contain. Which, for which there's a formidable history as well. And balance and contain produced an outcome in relation to the Soviet Union uh, through uh, Kennan's doctrine of containment from the late 40s through the eight, late 80s. So it is not as neatly packaged as John Mearsheimer's neatly realist view would suggest. The end of the Soviet Union was achieved peacefully in 1991. Union at a product, moment. At a product, yeah, but leading up to it, 
Uh, they had a near-death experience in Cuba in 62. They looked over in the abyss and said, that is a very long way down. This is not a good place to be. And then for the last 30 years of the Soviet Union, what did these guys do? Through a combination of detente um, and a range of other political arrangements put between Moscow and Washington, they decided never to go to the edge again. Um, and so therefore the, the clear, clear cut Mearsheimian view, Mish, Mearsheim, how do you say that? Mearsheimian, yep. Mearsheimian. <laughs> yeah. Okay, non-Ruddian view. Uh, <laughs> is that diplomacy is all bullshit, uh, has no role in any of this stuff. Whereas, frankly, uh, Cannon and the realists throughout the period of containment mm. were constantly engaged in the business of diplomacy in order to take states back from the abyss. So I think it's not a clear-cut world as the great prophet from the University of Chicago. Had. <laughs> but hasn't the Biden administration, and this is a bipartisan issue in Washington, as you well know, hasn't the Biden administration's technological uh, decoupling, this is the... Um, the export bans on uh, advanced semiconductors uh, to China. Doesn't that vindicate the argument that the United States will indeed go to great lengths to stop China's rise? That's true. But again, this is uh, an evolving arc, which has come from a period of engagement plus hedge, a period of strategic competition. And now, if I was to categorise the actions by the administration on the 7th of October, which is the announcement of this list of extraordinary technology bans for export to China, uh, led by semiconductors, we are now moving into a period of technological containment. Uh, and this is um, a, uh, a strong realist measure, but if you like, still compatible with the original architecture of uh, Engage plus Hedge, uh, which we had agreed to back in the um, uh, 80s and 90s. But in Xi Jinping's mind, doesn't this policy by the Biden administration, by Washington, doesn't that just reaffirm his sensitivities about Western encirclement or US encirclement, which is just a gift for Chinese nationalism? Um, Chinese nationalism is self-fueling in the absence of that. Right. Chinese nationalism has been a script in evolution for quite some time. It's one of the things I've traced in terms of the historical narrative and the ideological narrative in China and the um, dissertation work I've just done uh, at Oxford. So that has been pre-existing well prior to these most recent measures. It's why I call Xi Jinping's worldview Marxist nationalism. There is a, an appeal to the ideological uh, argument represented by global Marxism-Leninism Marxism and its own appeal to dialectical materialism, historical materialism and the inevitable forces of history uh, producing um, ultimately a communist state and that is alive and well now within the Xi Jinping ideological worldview plus the, the nationalist ideology which says China is now the vehicle through which this shall be done not just to render China the most powerful country in the world but also as we discussed before to begin constructing an international order with Chinese characteristics. Okay. Peter Harcher says that the, um, quote, in light of the Albanese Xi meeting last week, the Australian apologist for China who, st who hysterically warned of economic Armageddon unless Canberra surrendered should be ashamed. Now, he doesn't name names, but he's thinking about the former ambassador, Jeff Raby, um, whom you served in Beijing, I think in the 1980s, um, former prime minister, uh, Paul Keating, um, they have complained that Canberra, under both governments, but particularly under the coalition government, has needlessly provoked Beijing. Who's right here, Peter Harcher or Paul Keating? You've been well trained by the ABC to put binary <laughs> alternatives. <laughs> <laughs> and, mate, again, I might be from Queensland, but I'm not dumb. But, the, but, um, but, but, but. Life is more complex than that. Can I just say this? The, uh, the person that I've engaged with, systemically on this question, because I think his argument is fundamentally flawed and from which many of the others proceed, is Hugh White. Yeah, Hugh White's argument in the quarterly essay, uh, which in its summary is along these lines. He's an ANU professor yeah, and former head well, of the Defence Department. Emeritus, yeah. Deeply influential uh, in what he writes in this country and the way it is actually uh, seen in the United States mm -hmm. as well, because it is well circulated throughout the think tank community in the United States. Uh, is that one, uh, China's rise is unavoidable. Two, um, that um, the United States, if it was to fight uh, China over Taiwan, would inevitably lose. Uh, or three, it may not fight over Taiwan, in, in which case four, uh, 
Uh, we should therefore, this is my paraphrase, uh, seek arrangements uh, with China at this stage. Now, that's the argument. Um, and I don't think that's an unfair summary if you look at his most recent quarterly essay. Now, I've basically always let this stuff just go through to the keeper. But I read this stuff last time it came out and I thought that's just dangerous um, because it uh, represents fundamental appeasement. And so I actually, for the first time, wrote a piece for the quarterly essay. Uh, 2,000 words, I don't know if you saw yes, it. Yes, it was in response to his I, quarterly essay. Yeah, yeah. I awarded him the Lord Halifax Award for, <laughs> uh, for appeasement. Um, and I use that term. Yep. Uh, I think I've fallen off Hugh's Christmas card list as a result. But I think it's a dangerous set of arguments, but it's also unempirical. Yep. It's unempirical because it argues a priori that China's rise is inevitable. China is doing everything it can at the moment to alter its domestic growth model for the economy. Growth has slowed to 2% this year, projected to be not much more than about 3 or 4% for the next two years. This is a massive turnaround in terms of the Chinese growth formula that we have seen over a, uh, the last 30 years. So will the Chinese course correct on the economy? Possibly. But can we simply assume uh, that um, the Chinese economy is going to grow in linear terms? That's unempirical. There's a lot, to, a lot to be seen yet. And secondly, to assume that the Americans would not fight over Taiwan is unempirical. We don't know that. Given what Biden has declared on the on the uh, on the public uh, front, it would seem not. And thirdly, part of the inference which uh, is contained in Hugh's article that the Taiwanese themselves may not fight is again unempirical based on systematic opinion poll research. I'm losing this device, so uh, and I'll try. And put yeah, you're right. Why are you doing that? I was just going to say, in fairness to Hugh White, he he emphasises the very deep divisions in the United States. And it's a very polarizing country, more so than probably any time, certainly since the late 60s during the Vietnam War. And he also makes the point that, um, that, uh, that um, this could sap America's staying power in the region. I want to run this quote uh, by you, and we'll get to your question in a moment. Robert Gates, whom you knew, Defense Secretary under both Presidents Bush and Obama, he says, quote, the greatest threat to American national security is encompassed within the two square miles that involve the Capitol and the White House. Now, that might be hyperbole, but isn't it true that the sheer polarization of American politics is so extreme that unifying the country seems beyond any of the nation's leading politicians? And to the extent that those trends continue, doesn't that hurt American staying power in the region? In fairness to Hugh White, Kevin Rudd. The... Um Assumption on the part of White um, is that uh, the United States uh, may not fight. And that, I think, is an unhelpful and not useful premise upon which to construct this country's national security and foreign policy. Secondly, um, the divisions in American politics at this stage occur around every subject other than China. Republicans and the Democrats have one unity ticket at the moment. As I said, it has its intellectual origins in H.R. McMaster 2017, but also its continuation under both the National Security Strategy of 2022, the National Defence Strategy of 2022, and Secretary of State Blinken's China Strategy of May this year, which he released at the Our Asia Society. It's a bipartisan issue. That's the point, and therefore glossing over the top of that is, I think, a huge analytical assumption on people like Hugh's part. But I think to go to one further question for this country, for the future, we have to always have a weather eye on where the Republican Party now goes because there are isolationist traditions within the Republican Party which are emerging. Uh, if you ask people who are close to Trump, what would Trump have done? We had a Taiwan Straits crisis in the period from 2016 to 2020. If you, if you had have asked uh, Bolton that, given Trump's appalling uh, a set of appeasing actions towards Kim Jong-un uh, during that period, the North Korean dictator, it is um, difficult to assume that Trump would have acted as a normal Republican president of the United States. Now, with the post-2020 um, Republican Party, does that isolationist tradition within the Republican Party uh, grow? Does it remain static or does it decline? 
If you look at the midterms and the non-re-election of people at the far-right Republican fringe, you would tend to suggest, tend to conclude that it may have reached its natural, as it were, high point. But to be fair to the critics, including Hugh White, we need to maintain a weather eye on the, um, on the mainstream of American politics and where it goes. Because um, if the, uh, this isolationist tradition returns in much bigger form than we currently see it, then it is a material factor for the Chinese. Okay, but you argue in your book, The Avoidable War, that China made, quote, phenomenal progress from 2016 to 2020, courtesy of Donald Trump. And you say the US as the stabilising fulcrum in the international order started to wobble. China didn't believe their luck. And you go on to say the diminishing of US standing was unprecedented. That's what you say in your book. But you also just mentioned that his national security advisor, McMaster, under his leadership, Trump administ- Trump's administration intensified the security and economic competition with as China. Bolton would That's have not isolationist. No, no, no. But as Bolton would have said in this gathering, this was an administration divided unto itself. Mm. Look at Bolton's critique of, uh, of Trump, not just in his book but more broadly. And the fact that H.R. McMaster did the rational thing and drafted a new national security strategy um, – we should reflect on the fact that he remained as national security advisor for a little more than one year <laughs> That's right. before he was given the left foot of Christian fellowship. Yeah, but none, of, but none, of, uh, none of Trump's uh, national security advisors were isolationists, to be fair. No, that's true. But when you look at the president, the commander-in-chief, who in this order um, questioned the necessary longevity of American troop presence on the Korean Peninsula, said the Japanese should be paying a whole lot more money uh, for um, uh, basing rights across uh, across yeah, Japan. Yeah, to, to be fair, though, Japan's spending one what was was spending one percent of GDP on defence. They should be spending at least two percent. Separate argument, my friend, which is what <laughs> they should be spending nationally, as opposed to what the basing agreements are. And thirdly, um, Trump repeatedly publicly saying, "Why the hell are we in NATO? Uh, what's the point?" You don't have to be a Rhodes Scholar sitting in Beijing and saying, I think they're beginning to unravel uh, the, the network, the global network of American security alliances. Oh. And, uh, and that's why – that's what underpins the argument that I put because if he's the commander-in-chief, it doesn't matter who the national security advisor is, they walk in and say, we have crisis X. What would Trump have done in the case of the Ukraine crisis? Mm. What would he have done given that so many equivocal statements have already been made – in the last few months by Trumpian Republicans challenging whether... Well, Liberal Democrats as well on Ukraine, to be fair. Uh, that's true, but the Republicans have been out there stronger and mm. earlier. Yeah. There was a breakout of about 24... Let's keep to China. Republican. Next question. Thank you for a great discussion. My question is, how often a real-world political scenario is far from an academic speculation? Are you talking about Taiwan or...? Uh, just generally political ac- academic that often speculate on a scenario and how often you, fo- you have found yourself that what they are speculating on is just far from the reality. Let me answer your question in a slightly different way. One of the reasons for sitting down and reading both the primary sources and the academic literature on Xi Jinping's ideological framework was to reach a conclusion about is there a connection between, let's call it, um, Xi Jinping's version of Marxism-Leninism on the one hand and what he actually does in the real world of policy on politics, the economy and foreign security policy. And I began with a fairly open mind on this question because I'd never read seriously Marxism-Leninism because, I mean, we both... We've grown up in the you know the post sort of commie world, um, uh, and even those of us who were studying China through this period, and I began studying Chinese after the Cultural Revolution, so this was kind of not a frame. Um, and because we saw Deng Xiaoping for thirty five years saying, "Let's forget about all that theory stuff. Let's just make money." and grow the economy, and that was Dungism, which is why everyone around the world was comfortable with it, um, including um, those who were engaging and hedging, um, is to reread uh, the literature on Marxism-Leninism and the Chinese Communist Party history back to 1921 when it was formed, to read where he was redefining the Marxist-Leninist narrative for the party and then doing my own attempt at triangulation, that is, here are the ideological shifts I can map in the literature, 
When do they start moving the party towards the Leninist left through new control measures in the world of practice? That is, new system controls which took out some of the smaller uh, democratic reforms within party governance that uh, Xi Jinping's predecessors had instituted. They did come after his ideological pronouncements. Similarly with the move to the Marxist left on the economy, it didn't happen straight away like in 2013, just after he took power. But on the economy, it started happening in 2017. If you look at the growth numbers, they'd started to collapse through the impact of the change uh, on private fixed capital investment in China from about 18 and 19 before COVID. And so what I've discovered, to go to your question of, does therefore the academic analysis bear fruit in being a predictor of real world changes in behaviour? When you're looking at an ideationally chat charged system like a Marxist-Leninist system. When they change the script at the centre with a 96 million member party, uh, then the evidence in the last 10 years suggests that that represents the headwaters for change in the real world of public policy. And that's the reason for writing this stuff is to actually send out a bit of a, a clarion call to the world to say, this is changing and we need to be mindful of it. It's not just Aquinas talking about the number of angels in the end of a pinhead and saying this is an abstract world of theology, ideology with no relevance to the real world. It matters, like it did in the days of the Soviet Union. Okay, next question here from the lady in the front. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Um, we just had, oh, the world just had COP22 recently and um, the whole climate change. COP27. COP27, sorry. Mm. Uh, I thought it was this year's one but I got mixed up. Anyway, um, my biggest question, yeah, that's right. Uh, my The biggest question I have is that um, this is going to have a huge impact on the global economy, how, what people are or governments are doing and uh, companies are doing in regard to changing from fossil fuels to something else. Um, how much of a free kick do you think we're giving China by calling them a developing nation rather than a developed nation? And while they're trying to undermine the UN and the world order, the UN itself is saying you don't have to play in the same game that everyone else does. I think if you, I mean, part of the... Um breakthrough we achieved way back when in COP16 uh, at Copenhagen was finally to crack the nut uh, which said that developing countries had no responsibility at all. Uh, back then we got three breakthroughs. One, 1 1.5 degrees centigrade, trying to keep greenhouse gas emissions within that through to century's end. Um, two, uh, developed and developing country action being necessary. That was fought right through until the very end of that conference. I remember it uh, in the crazy green room environment we were negotiating at the time. And number three was to have an effective, uh, an intrusive set of arrangements, what's called um, measurement, reporting and verification, who's cheating and who's not basically. So that kind of happened uh, back then. The flow through it since then has been fascinating to watch. Uh, the Chinese, uh, this was in 2009, they fought that every step of the way at the Copenhagen conference. By about 2012, you start to see the Chinese own domestic science come in as they recognise that they are now facing uh, the domestic environmental consequences uh, of climate change within their own country. And by the time you get to about 2015, on the uh, edge of the Paris um, uh, conference of the parties, which was COP, Oh, well, yeah, Par the Paris Climate the Change. The Paris Climate yeah. I'm, now, I'm now in your world. I can't remember which cop it was. <laughs> uh, but, uh, I, I copped out about that time. The, um, uh, is that the Chinese uh, finally concluded that what was at stake for them was that if they didn't act to bring down their own emissions over time, um, that they were going to actually have a major climate crisis domestically by mid-century, which would undermine their national objectives to become the preeminent global power by mid-century. And that is why you start to see the, the, the dial change in terms of Chinese action. Right now, um, if you look carefully at what China has done with its three objectives of stated policy, which is 
carbon uh, neutrality by 2060, that's too late for the planet. Uh, carbon peaking by 2030, that's about five years too late for the planet. And no more investment in coal-fired power stations in third countries. Uh, so far they've honoured that, uh, but there's a huge pipeline uh, which has already been funded. Um, our pressure on China should be to do about two or three times what they're currently doing in order to meet the old absolute carbon ceiling which the country needs, uh, which the world needs by, by, by mid-century in order to be effective. Are they cheating on what they have done? I'm paraphrasing your question here. The evidence that I have since uh, the, um, uh, the last two or three through, years through COVID and also through what we've seen uh, with, uh, now with Russia is the language Xi Jinping is using is this. We cannot bring on the new until um, uh, we cannot get rid of the old, that is coal-fired power stations, until the new is fully reliable. Yes. In, in his speech a few weeks ago, he said, we will not rush its, our clean energy transformation. China won't stop burning fossil fuels until we are confident clean energy can re reliably replace and that's them. That's true. And yeah. No, no. No, that's what I'm saying is that um, that is there. The planning documents haven't changed. He's given a political authorization to slow it down. So the only thing I could say in response to your question, though, is that the monitoring now of what China is doing on the ground is infinitely better than it used to be. So if China suddenly goes into reverse and does not bring on these huge number of extra renewable energy capabilities which they are deploying through their solar systems and what they're now doing, beginning to do with green hydrogen and the rest, we will know about it rapidly because the monitoring systems are now pretty good. So I'm disappointed by the statements about slowdown, um, which you've seen in the 20th Party Congress report. Slowdown's not reversal. Um, that's just... Yeah, you know, my best assessment of what I've read. But I mean, following on from your excellent question, aren't we in the West at a strategic disadvantage if we continue to rush with a decarbonisation agenda? And China, I mean, these are the facts, they emit two thirds more carbon emissions than Europe and the US combined. Coal accounts for 50% of China's power generation and more new coal plants are set for approval in coming years. Are we being taken for fools? Are they, in other words, rat effing us, as you put it memorably, in Copenhagen. I thought you were with the ABC. Now I know. Now I know uh, you're with 2GB. <laughs> the, uh, I'm from Queensland. I would never use bad language. So. Well, you said yeah. effing. You didn't actually say the word. Uh, I can't remember. Now. It was <laughs> such a long time ago. But... Um, no, but, but isn't there a serious point here about China taking advantage of, of Western economies? No, hang, hang on. No, no. Question to Kevin Rudd. When I look at where the beast was, which I mean Chinese aggregate emissions in 2009, and where it would be in 2022, absent policy change, it would be much, much worse than it currently is. That's my first point. To get them to I mean, their actually, emissions would be much worse. Yeah, yeah. Yep. And so, to get this enormous ship to change course from hydrocarbons, burn baby, burn, uh, through to renewables, at least by way of policy shift, has been a massive exercise, both in terms of international pressure initially, but then domestic scientific consensus, which followed. And so, uh, the question is: um, uh, glass half full, glass half empty. Uh, secondly, uh, in terms of cumulative emissions, and you know, on the question of climate change, it's what's been put out there into the atmosphere so far uh, from carbon-based emissions and what's being added each year. Right now, China still lags behind the cumulative contribution uh, uh, in carbon emissions that we have from the United States and certainly the United States plus Europe. But if the Chinese do not uh, continue their course correction, by the time we get to the 2040s, China's current and cumulative emissions will be greater than the Western world. So they must act, otherwise their historical argument, it's just what the West has done, falls apart. And, that, and China has those rare earth minerals. Is there a danger that Western countries could become dependent on China for lithium batteries for renewable energy? The truth is right now uh, we are in a process of early stages of technological decoupling I mentioned semiconductors before. We are in an, the early stages of 
of the development of energy policies which are seeking to achieve greater and greater levels of national self-reliance in parts of the world so that you're no longer dependent on exposed um, sea lines of communication in the event of a security crisis. And this does not just affect us, it affects the Japanese, it affects the, the Koreans, it affects the other democracies. And look at uh, look what's happening with acute energy dependency in Europe at the moment in terms of Russian supplied gas. Um, so therefore, what is happening both through the Quad and what is happening through uh, a range of allied countries' national energy security strategies is and and which category you would include lithium for the reasons you've just put, is they are moving towards greater, greater levels of resilience. The planning activity now underway within governments is intense. Actions are already unfolding. Um, uh, and if I look carefully at China's own actions, they mirror them. China is seeking to, and to use the language of the 20th Party Congress, to achieve national security resilience in its international supply chains. So as the West is doing it, including countries like this one, so too is China doing it in the reverse direction. That's a question beyond lithium. That's across anything in which China itself is critically dependent on the world. Kevin, thank you. Next question. Yes, I can't see you, but you have the mic. Pleasure to be here. Uh, I've got a quick question for you. Um, in this sense, uh, given Australia's um, increasing rolling back of domestic refinery and manufacturing capabilities, for example, steel refinery and oil refinery, does that present an increased security or strategic risk to Australia should the US and China go to war and those resources be needed for defence of the country? If my overall argument, which I've reflected uh, in the last several days in the Crawford Lecture in Canberra and the Larkins Lecture at Monash last night, is accurate, and that is we do not face the immediate risk of a, um, of a war by design over Taiwan in the next five years. But beyond the next five years, um, Xi Jinping's preferred political timetable for securing Taiwan's return to Chinese sovereignty is from the late 20s into the 19th and into the 2030s, uh, when he will still be in power, then part of contingency planning for that period means for countries like ourselves and for others achieving greater and greater levels of national resilience. And resilience is different from self-sufficiency. Resilience in terms of our critical energy and raw material needs, as well as as you've just pointed to, uh, refining capabilities and other categories of manufacturing. Now, the policy challenge for the United States and its allies, including the Taiwanese, in the period ahead is to so intensify deterrence, military, financial, economic, foreign policy and political, so that whatever China's preferred timetable for moving on Taiwan might be, that Chinese political and economic leaders in the late 20s and early 30s advise their leader that the risks are still too great for China to act. Right now, the reason why there is no action now is that both sides fear that they would lose or could lose because the balance of power is so tight across the Taiwan Straits at present. So the real why I have sort of sounded the bell on this in the last week is that we really do face another the five years ahead an acute challenge to ensure that deterrence is strengthened across the world um, because, as I have outlined in that book, the consequences of a general war between the United States and China over Taiwan, irrespective of allied participation, are catastrophic for global security, stability and the economy. It would throw the global economy into depression. These are the world's two largest economies. We've never had an historical precedent of the two largest economies in the world going into a general war. Owen oh, Harry's once said, those who lack the imagination of disaster are doomed to be surprised by the world. Owen was a really smart guy and that is absolutely right. Yeah, John Connor. In terms of Taiwan, it, there's most of the um, commentary on Taiwan in terms of the US and China relations, etc., seems to be predicated on the idea that China could commence a conventional war against Taiwan. And personally, that seems to be highly unlikely that given the time span, even the time span you've outlined, 
that there's plenty of room for China to make a series of slow moves using cyber warfare to begin with, but but the, it, strangling Taiwan in a variety of ways rather than raining bombs on fellow Han Chinese, which frankly I don't think would go down terribly well in China itself, particularly given President Xi's constant recitation at times of, uh, of the importance of the Han race. Which is why when you buy a copy of the book outside... <laughs> <laughs> I have it already, actually. I've read I it. I actually outline uh, a spectrum of scenarios for Taiwan for which a full-scale military invasion is the last of four or five. The spectrum would include, as you've just correctly anticipated, initial cyber attacks to dismantle or disable the political and military administration of Taiwan. Um, then you've got to think through what would be the retaliatory actions both by the Taiwanese and the United States and where does that lead to in terms of escalation. The second uh, form of possible um, measure would be by the Chinese to replicate at scale what we saw trialled in terms of the uh, effective blockading of the island most recently in retaliation for the Nancy Pelosi visit where you had rockets uh, live fired at right up and down the east and west coast and across the north and south of the island and the effect was to suspend maritime trade for three days and to suspend air traffic by and large for three days. So that was, if you like, an early trial. But think that through in terms of escalation. If you're the Taiwanese, uh, are you going to allow yourself to be passively economically strangled? Are you going to try and break the blockade? How do you break the blockade? You can seek to do so by your own national means, then you're into escalation and then the Americans intervene. The third one is that the Chinese salami slice, uh, Taiwan, um, as you know from the geography, there are small offshore islands, Jinmen, Mazu and the others, um, which the Chinese could, for example, seek to take and to demonstrate American military impotence or political reluctance, challenge the Americans to intervene for which they couldn't command a domestic political constituency to go in and to defend Taiwan's offshore islands, which are 12 kilometres off the mainland coast. Um, but it's all part of the whittling down of resolve. What would the Taiwanese do themselves? Pretty hard if you're a Taiwanese president to say, oh, well, we've just surrendered our offshore islands to the Chinese. Sorry about that. Again, you've got the potential for real escalation there. And the final one is the Million Man Swim, uh, which is... Uh, which is a full amphibious and airborne assault on the island, uh, which would be larger than D-Day and would have all the collateral implications that you mentioned, including the, the horrors of uh, social media replaying back in China itself of tens of thousands of Taiwanese civilians being killed of, of the type that we've seen in some measure in Ukraine. Now to do the vote of thanks, I call on my colleague Alice Hahn, who's our scholar in residence for the summer of 22, 23. Thanks, Alice. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an immense honour and privilege to propose this vote of thanks to the former Prime Minister of Australia, Dr Kevin Rudd. We have all benefited greatly tonight um, from his incisive comments and reflections today. On behalf of CIS and this audience, I would like to thank you, Dr Rudd, uh, for the generosity of your time, wisdom and analysis. As this year's scholar in residence at CIS, I have been working closely with Tom Spitzer and his excellent team to think, write, and publish deeply on the subject of US-China tech competition. And tonight's conversation has uh, underpinned and underscored the strategic and global significance, I think, of US-China relations and the imperative to construct strategic guardrails to reduce the possibilities of war in our time. It is also a reminder of the importance of CIS as an institution. Uh, CIS, unlike other think tanks, does not receive tax dollars and relies solely on the generosity of foundations and individuals such as yourselves. In a world where the lines between reality and falsehood have become more and more uh, blurred, politicized and radicalized, I would put forth that we desperately need individuals like Dr. Rudd and organizations like the CIS that will critically and empirically evaluate the intractable, intractable challenges that we face today and engineer intelligent, pragmatic solutions to resolve them. And I will end with a quote from the late CIS fellow and leading Australian conservative, conservative intellectual Owen Harries. Understand the position of your adversary, not in a caricatured or superficial form, but at its strongest, 
for until you have rebutted it at its strongest, you have not rebutted it at all. This is a necessary condition both for developing your own position fully and attacking your opponent successfully. Mm -hmm. And I think it goes without saying that we have definitely engaged in that exercise tonight. So on that note, I would like to um, uh, join with you all in thanking Dr. Rudd for his time tonight. Thank you. For decades, CIS has been a fiercely independent voice working hard to promote sound liberal principles. To be notified of our future videos, make sure you subscribe to our channel, then click the notification bell. We rely solely on the generosity of people like you for donations to advance our classical liberal cause. Check out the links on screen now to see how you can get involved. Mm -hmm.